And until I understood the power of, yeah, accessing the subconscious and, you know, overriding these old belief systems and literally, you know, creating a new sense of self, essentially, in a very, very mild way, that's when everything changed. From To Be Magnetic, this is The Expanded Podcast with your host, Lacey Phillips. As the leading destination for neural manifestation, we dispel the woo-woo in order to help you create real, tangible results based on neuroplasticity, psychology, epigenetics, and energetics. Our goal is to normalize the practice of manifestation and empower you to get into the driver's seat of your life in order to manifest the experiences, relationships, and things that most align with your authenticity. Part of our manifestation process entails expanding past your limiting subconscious beliefs. Therefore, by tuning into this podcast with interviews from experts, thought leaders, spiritual teachers, scientists, and those with neural manifestation success stories, you're starting the process of expanding your subconscious in order to see to believe that anything you desire is possible. And by pressing play, the process begins. Hey everyone, Jessica here, co-host of the Expanded Podcast. I wanted to pop on this morning and share my magnetic story of how I manifested my absolute dream swivel white reading chair with the vocal material on it. So I'm working through Shadow this month alongside all of you, and one theme that I'm really taking through it is abundance. And in my authentic code, one of my code words is home and being aligned with my home. I love interior design, all of those fun things. And I was seeing where I wasn't being abundant in my home. And when I looked around at the pieces of furniture I had in my home, I was noticing a trend of two things. I was really abundant in getting upcycled furniture, so furniture that people were tossing to the curb or selling for extremely discounted on Facebook Marketplace, so I was repurposing and reusing those items, or I was really abundant in getting gifted nice big pieces, like a nice luxury bed. But where I was really lacking was feeling abundant in purchasing a high price point item that was new. I'd always gotten something at a discount. I always make sure to be thrifty about it and reuse items. And while I still love doing that, the abundance that I really need to unblock, especially around my home, was saying to myself, I can afford and not go into debt, which is key. (laughs) I can afford to purchase big ticket items for my home that help bring out my highest joy when I'm enjoying my space at home. So I had this one particular chair in mind from a brand. I had seen that they had discounted the chair once before for $100 off. So in my mind, I was like, cool, I'll pay $100 off. It's still more than I've ever paid for any chair in my life. And I'm going to try to manifest that number going down past 100 and then I can purchase from that store. And so I was working through a shadow workshop, looking at my abundance. I worked through the triggers DI to really see why I didn't feel worthy of spending it, why I had never really spent that before on any home items, uh, why I was so nervous about spending it, what it would mean, what it would even look like to see that money leaving my account for a physical home item instead of putting in my savings account. And I started getting tests immediately. There was a rocking chair that popped up on Facebook Marketplace for $40 with the exact material I wanted. And then there was the Gwyneth CB2 chair, which wasn't the chair that I wanted, but it was very similar. And that was discounted. Someone was selling their old chair. But again, these were not new. So I knew that they were tests. And I went in the test. Yeah, I was like, okay, I'm close. This is a great sign. I'm moving in the right direction. How can I take more aligned action? The biggest thing that kept coming up was these tests were pretty easy to pass because I could see that they weren't new. They weren't in the price range that I was trying to pay for it. It would feel like settling back into that old lack pattern around not being able to afford something new for myself. 
But what I knew was really being asked of me is, am I comfortable letting this amount of money leave my bank account without a special plan around it? I'm a very big budgeter and planner and having an unexpected furniture cost is not fit into my budget. So I had this doctor's bill come through that wound up being a lot higher than I had anticipated, aka a lot of money needing to leave my bank account without a spot in the budget for it. And I actually got really excited. In the past, before doing this work, I would have freaked out. I would have been crying in tears, not sure what to do with it, very upset. But because I've been working on lack for a long time, I was able to see it for what it was. And it was an opportunity for me to say, okay, here's an unexpected amount of money leaving my bank account that's not in my budget, and I can still be okay. I can strengthen my trust muscle and say, okay, this may be a quote unquote scary thing in the past, but right now I'm able to afford it. I paid the bill and the next day the chair was 8% off, which wound up being a very minimal amount. It wasn't at $100 off, which I was anticipating. I was like, whew, okay, I feel like I jumped off a big cliff here. I think what's being asked of me is to A, not go for the 8% off, that quick little discount, and think that there's no chance that it'll go to 100 off, and also have patience. I was noticing this connection between abundance and patience, and how in true abundance, I know things are coming for me, and I don't need to set a timeline or a budget in order to flow with them. So I did the Prosperity DI, and at this point, I'm doing the Prosperity DI almost every day because I know the manifestation is close. I know I need to continually reprogram and reinforce this lack mentality and really start to change my neural pathways because it's so close. I journaled on that for a while. The next morning, I get a notification that there is one brand new version of the chair, 50% off if you get it at their warehouse location. And I was able to run out and be the first one there. I knew the chair was mine. There was a few other people that were vying for this chair and I was able to get there. And I got there and the guy selling it was like, wow, I can't even believe you got this chair. You know, there was so many people who I've been messaging since seven this morning about picking this up and it was first come first serve. And I was like, oh no, I manifested this. I knew this was mine. (laughs) And he was like, okay, oh boy. But it really just proves that what you think is just manifesting a physical chair is all of these stories and programming of lack or scarcity or fear that is lying dormant beneath it. And so, yes, I was able to manifest a beautiful chair, and that's an awesome story. But what's even more important to me is I'm able to have a currency with money again. I'm able to allow room for flow and ease and for more money to come out of my account some months than others, as long as I can afford it, as long as it's within my worth and I'm not going into debt on it, I am deserving of that flow in ease. So hopefully that's helpful. I'll share a little bit more on my Instagram story about it. And here's to manifesting in abundance. And now a word from our partners. So when we first decided to start working with partners on this podcast to take it to the next level, being able to bring on even greater experts than you've been experiencing, we decided that brands had to go through a very extensive filtration process, which you've heard me talk about in the past. One of which has to be, it's a product that we've been using and loving collectively. And so there's one product that our marketing director has been telling us about for ages, Grace, who isn't really a very big supplementy person, so I trust her. And she's definitely the ultimate consumer. She does try a lot of things. And I personally stopped taking any form of probiotics quite a bit ago due to not only the bean protocol, like going off all supplements, but once I heard her talking about it and knowing that in pregnancy, my group B strep test would be coming up. For those of you who don't know, it's a pretty important test that happens later in pregnancy and you're birthing at a hospital, as I may be doing. Uh, You do have to be on a form of antibiotics or penicillin. And so I was really, really trying to make sure that my gut was in the best place possible. So I gave Seed Probiotics a try. There are so many things I want to say about this company that I love. So I'm going to start with the highlights that I think are the most interesting. 
So I love that it's not a traditional supplement pill. I stopped any form of those a long time ago with the bean protocol, like I mentioned. But what's really going on there is that it's a two-in-one capsule, meaning that the outer part is a prebiotic to ensure that it makes it fully past your bile and stomach acid. So it's the only probiotic that has a 100% survival rate, whereas most of its competitors and other probiotics out there only have about 20% that make it to the colon. And that's the prebiotic on the outside. So prebiotic feeds any of our already healthy bacteria, making it not your normal everyday capsule. And then the inner part of it is the actual probiotic, which has 24 strains, 53.6 53.6 AFU, more accurate than CFU, and covers the full spectrum of everything that you need in a probiotic. It's the first that's 100% scientifically backed to prove that. And just for a tiny tidbit that's so interesting is Dr. Gregory Reed, who is on their science board, chief scientist, because they have a really extensive science board. He's the one who originally coined the term probiotic way back when it was being discovered. And that's who's backing up this incredible product. And not to get too sciencey, but it's the stuff I really appreciate out there when there isn't actually a lot of regulation that occurs with supplements that can be on the market inside of health food stores, for instance, that this particular probiotic has been clinically studied in 16 strain-specific, double-blind, placebo-controlled published human studies, as well as 13 in vitro, ex vitro mechanistic studies. So that means that it's been extremely vetted and studied, whereas again, most uh, herbs and products that you just get on the health food store don't have that. Another thing that I do, of course, is eat fermented foods. However, with this, you know that you're covered with the full spectrum of probiotics that your body needs, which have been shown to drastically improve candida, SIBO, leaky gut, et cetera, et cetera. And just to finish out my story of my test, it did come up negative. I can't say that it was because of this product, but as I was really prepping for it to ensure that hopefully I could go through a birth without any form of antibiotic or penicillin, I'm really grateful to have had this tool in my tool belt. So for anybody who's out there looking for a probiotic that has been scientifically tested, the bacteria makes it 100% to your colon, also having a prebiotic inside of it to feed the already healthy bacteria to grow further and have a better synthesis for folate and B12, go ahead and check out Seed Probiotic. Next time when I talk about them, I'll get into how crazy and incredible their sustainability program is with their packaging, but I'll save that till then. Go ahead and use the code, all caps, TBM15 to receive 15% off your first month. Again, that's TBM15 to receive 15% off your first month. Today we have a really exciting episode. Lacey was interviewed on the Saturn Returns podcast by Kagi Dunlop, who is a UK TV personality and media host. Kagi and Lacey had met once before while I believe Lacey was on the speaking tour in London. And the two hit it off wildly and Lacey wound up going on the podcast. And we thought this would be such a great episode for you guys to dive into because you can see some of the insights to the basis of our manifestation work, but also go through really clear examples of what it looks like to pass tests around a partnership, work through shadow and shame, and all of the things that we've kind of been touching on this month. So without further ado, here is the episode. Hi, Lacey. Hello. How are you doing? I'm so good. Thank you so much for joining I'm me. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for having me. I don't know if I told you this when we met, but your podcast was the first podcast I believe that I ever listened to. Wow. But for those listening that don't know about you and your work, would you be able to do a little introduction? Absolutely. So... 
I basically, I'll kind of give a little backstory so it sounds pretty grounded, but basically I came to LA to act and model, I think as many people do, and I was broke and didn't have any control over my monetary existence. And my mom always had a clairvoyant that she spoke to growing up. She was always into all of the things as well as my grandmother. So for my birthday at around 17, I think it was, she got me a session with her clairvoyant. And the clairvoyant said, buy this book on manifestation, follow it to a T and you'll manifest everything you want. And it was very much that old manifestation rhetoric of think positive, visualize, pretend to be what you want to be before it comes. And I followed it so heavily to a T and went down the full rabbit hole of the secret and the Hicks books and all of the things we're all familiar with. And I would manifest little things, but never really big things, which was frustrating for any of us who have done that path because you're like, I'm in the fucking vortex. (laughs) Why isn't anything happening? You know, so abstract and so much spiritual bypass. And so around 25, after being a doormat and dating, I actually noticed a, I started to tune into my own gifts. I channel and I can read energy and I'm very, very good at reading patterning. If you don't mind me asking, how did you suddenly tap into that? Were you always aware that you had that gift or did it suddenly become apparent? It's so interesting because my mom has all of the gifts. She's like a medium, clairvoyant, audience, sentient. She has everything, dreamer, everything. And so I grew up always knowing about them. And my grandmother was a channeler and a medium, but I never could like detect, you know, that I had them. And why it was so challenging was because it took me a very long time to spot that my main though I have subtle of most of them, my main one is that I'm claircognizant. And so that's the hardest one. (laughs) I think it's the most abstract gift to have because rather than seeing into the future or hearing, you know, your guides communicate to you and all of that, I just know things. And I was like doing my fair share of partying and all of that good stuff of numbing out throughout my early 20s, you know. So so, wait, for those that don't know, so as in it just means that you know. Yeah, so what it, it looks like for me is let's say, Kagi, you walk up to me and you're seeing someone new and you're kind of speaking about him. I will just know. I'll be like, if she does this, this will happen. He is X, Y, and Z for her or good. So it's just, I know things. So it's like, I'm not seeing visions of the future. And so it took me a really long time to trust that knowing because I think when you're first starting to play with your intuitive gifts, I think everybody has them. So everybody listening, you certainly have your own. It's really about figuring out your own patterning and really trusting it. And so it took me a long time and we'll get into that more, but having very low self-worth, actually trusting when I would have all of these downloads. Would you say that those things are connected in terms of having low self-worth and not trusting your gifts? I think that's, yeah, not trusting in yourself and having confidence. I would say the root of that is feeling truly like the energetic root is unlovable or not worthy. So I would say that for most things in your life, absolutely connected. Because that is a huge component to the work that you do, isn't it? Around self-worth. It is. Yes. I started to realize, wow, this has nothing to do with positivity, but it has everything to do with when I step into my self-worth, what I want magnetizes towards me. And so an example of that was this partner I had made a list for, you know, it was like everything, I mean, crazy things like Parisian family and, you know, photographer, long blonde server, (laughs) really (laughs) crazy shit that you asked for at 25. And he turned up. (laughs) He totally turned up. And then also a really crazy one that really got my attention was I was, you know, in a very expensive apartment at the time and I had had three different friends, you know, we'll get into expanders, but three different people in my life talk about how they manifested this crazy guest house. You know, one was in Laurel Canyon for under $500 and a lot of those kind of coincidences of very affordable living spaces and very nice places. And I was like, oh, well, if they can do it, I can do it too. And so I called out this list, you know, for a place under $500 in the hills Everything's very expensive there, certainly in the hills. And I manifested a $325 apartment with everything on my list. And it was always after I stepped into my self-worth, I didn't settle and I expanded. And I went, holy shit, manifestation has nothing to do 
with visualizing and thinking positive, it has everything to do with then. That was sort of the genesis. And so what we teach it to be magnetic is a form of manifestation that's deeply rooted in neuroscience, psychology, and my energetic gifts. When you, so when you started manifesting these things at quite, I guess, a young age before you had created this sort of infrastructure of the to be magnetic formula, did you know that you'd already done the self-worth work or was that something that sort of happened simultaneously whilst it was going on? So it was a five-year period after that 25 mark where I threw everything away that I had ever learned, you know, because once I had the guy show up in the apartment, I was like, oh, fuck, I'm only doing whatever I've been doing. That but did made you that know what you've been doing? No. So it took a five-year process until third, well, even probably earlier, I would say 28. So maybe a three-year process of truly watching patterning really doing what would be the first genesis before I had ever heard of anything like shadow work and inner child work. I would have a lot of points where I love driving as an Aquarius. I just love being alone and and being on the road. And so I would often drive to the beach and I would take my journal. And while I was there, I started to put together patterning. So I was like, wow, you know, this guy I had dated strongly resembled how my aunt treated me when I was young. And I started to look at all of this, you know, all of what we call blocks from childhood and how I'm just recreating the exact same scenarios in different people and situations that I picked up in childhood. So patterning for people that don't know, can you break that down a little bit more? Sure. So it's it's literally what it sounds like. It's starting to look at the different things in your life that are showing up, noticing what they're, you know, similar to, whether it's energetically or presenting as it has in the past and starting to look at where the root of why you attracted that comes from. And I had never really been in true therapy. I had done that when I was a little, um, but didn't understand anything that was going on, you know, sort of around junior high years. So it was really interesting that I was sort of channeling this stuff that exists in the world, which is called inner child work and shadow. And I started to notice that it really is the basis of everything we project and manifest back to us that we imprinted from the ages of zero to seven Through neuroplasticity, we've learned that we continue to imprint, but really most things can be connected back to those years of zero to seven. So it was actually, yeah, that three-year process that I really looked and understood the energetics of manifestation. If I did this, then that would show up. And then at 29, I, it was 28, 29, I had been working at the most toxic faculty environment for a preschool. I was a preschool teacher, funny enough. It was so toxic and so strenuous, like energetically and emotionally that I ended up like blowing out my adrenals. You know, I was so not well by the end of it. And when I left, I went, okay, this is when I'm really going to put everything in motion that I've learned that, you know, like this whole hypothesis that I've been working on. And I went universe, I will never, ever work for another person again. And we'll get into the formula a little bit more, but I had expanded. I had unblocked. I had looked at everything in me that attracted that low self-worth working environment. So I knew I was at a good place to jump off this cliff. And so I was like, I'm not going to do anything. I have $4,000 in savings and I have a little bit of unemployment. You show me what to do next. And I kept getting these messages back of a blog, you know, and they kept showing me this blog. I don't know if you've heard of it, but called it was called My New Roots. It was really leading me into following this, like spirituality, holistic living. And it would be years before I put out manifestation. But when I jumped off that cliff, I started my blog everything started to happen. It was like the best flow of all flows. And I went, fuck, I have a crazy way that I know how to manifest (laughs) that really works. It's super actionable. It always works for me. And it's nothing to do with anything I've ever learned about before that felt really abstract and loosey-goosey. And it wasn't until about two, three years in, I think two years in to the blog that all of my resources dried up. I had become an herbalist. I was working with clients. I was a holistic chef and everything dried up. It was all around the holidays. So I didn't have any money. I had just gone through a breakup and in meditation, I kept getting the message. It was like, 
you know what you're on the earth to do. You need to put this out into the world and I'm not going to give you anything like resource wise until you do. And I was really afraid (laughs) to put this into the world because I grew up with like a very conservative cowboy dad in a very small town. Already having a holistic blog was so bonkers. And I was like, I'm about to come out and tell people I'm a manifestation advisor. And that was my (laughs) shit. (laughs) And I was like, oh no, there's no way I can do this. What are people from high school going to think? Yeah, well, the ego kind of gets in the way. And then also, I think what you've created, and it's why it's been so successful and so amazing, is no one's done it before, really. Like, I've never come across anyone that makes it also so formulaic and digestible. And I think that's why people have connected to it. But with anything like that, when you're taking that sort of jump, it's terrifying. And fear is always the gatekeeper on the precipice of anything great. Absolutely. And yes. And so within two weeks, I launched it. And then then talk about a flow. That was, that was a whole new level of any type of flow I've ever, ever experienced in my life. It was so, so super speed. For people that might be listening and thinking, you know, because I, I believe that everyone has, like you said as well, their own gifts. And it's just, we don't always know how to tap into them. So to go into your terminology for someone that perhaps isn't familiar with this work or with manifesting and is in, let's say, a job that they don't like, they aspire to do something different. Could you, using some of your terminology like rock bottoms and magic dark, explain what some of the pings, as it were, of the universe might be that are indicating that they should be pursuing something else and it's time to take a bit of a dive off the cliff? So essentially, the formula is made up on three Uh, really key factors. And then it becomes nuanced from there, but still really actionable. And so the first is unblocking. And so again, like what I was saying from zero to seven, everything that we've imprinted in our subconscious, we're currently still looping on and projecting out and receiving back. So wherever we experience high self-worth and accolade and love and acceptance and safety for who we are and being seen for who we are, we tend to manifest those things very simply or where we witnessed a lot of success without any uh, turmoil around it. And then anywhere we experience low self-worth, and again, when I say experience, this comes from many places. So it comes from media, peers, community, certainly parental modeling or caretaker modeling, anything we experienced as like one big TV system has imprinted this in us. And so the low self-worth is what continues to loop, project out and keep us stuck where we are or bringing in the things we don't want. So for anybody who's out there who's experiencing a rut or a rock bottom or somewhere they don't want to be or a dating pattern they don't want to exist in or a living situation or continually broke, any of those things are all changeable and they're just looping in your subconscious from where you pick them up. So that's just something to know that's incredibly powerful. There's nothing wrong with you. You don't have bad luck. Because it can be small experiences, can't it? I think people think, oh, well, I didn't have anything traumatic happen or I had a good upbringing and I had a good family. So they don't really want to look at that. And they think, you know, they feel like they might be blaming someone if they do. But like you say, these things can be so small and seemingly insignificant, but can have a huge impact on us and the way we see the world going forward. Absolutely. It can be so tiny. And I used to love when I used to take clients that would, I would get the ones that said I had the best upbringing in home life. And I'm like, you (laughs) might've, but still you've experienced pain and shame in your life from different facets or places you may not have even recognized. And it has nothing to do with the people of which you experience them from or witness them from, because this is your journey of unblocking them and raising them to be high self-worth. So when you're doing, for instance, like inner child work, a lot of people feel very guilty doing it because, you know, they feel like they're betraying their parents. And I always say this isn't a blaming game. It really has nothing to do with anybody else. And so like the beautiful thing about that unblocking process is we've learned through neuroscience and psychology, and we're so proud and excited to be magnetic that we brought on an advisor. She's 
a neuroscientist and she was a practicing psychiatrist of seven years, Dr. Tara Swart. She's actually UK based and she's on faculty at MIT. She's remarkable. So she's been with us, advising us and going through every workshop. And we have her on the podcast once a month in the Explain series. She goes through and breaks down the neuroplasticity of how we change the brain. So I had figured out this theory pretty early on that when we access our subconscious and bring it forward, we can actually get to the root of those memories and give it a new suggestion of healing and we can create a new neural pathway. And when we reinforce it enough, it becomes stronger and stronger. And the old pathway that's looping of low self-worth falls off and the new one that becomes strengthened projects out. And therefore you literally start projecting a whole new self-worth and you start to manifest in a whole new experience. So that's what the whole unblocking piece is. That's one of the foundations of the work. And then the second is... In old manifestation rhetoric, you always hear visualize. And I used to visualize so much. Like I always make the joke that I would be working at the Laugh Factory on Sunset, making $300 a week as a cocktail server, but visualizing my Malibu home with my infinity pool back then, (laughs) and like my sauna. Um, And it definitely wasn't coming. And I started to realize again through simple psychology that The visualizing part, though, that can be important for many things, and there's a lot of science that backs up the importance of visualizing. However, if you're somebody like me who had never grown up exposed to that, and especially it wasn't reinforced while I was growing up that I could have that, I realized the importance of finding expanders. That's what we call it. And what that is, is going out and finding people who you identify with wherever they used to be that you're currently at, they've gone on to have or be successful in what you do want. And when we find enough expanders, the lower our self-worth, the more we need, usually typically three, if we have very low belief around it, you'll have this really incredible moment where you'll go, oh, wow, wait a second. If they could do it, I can do it too. And that's what creates space in the brain for what you want you know, in your subconscious, like it could be anything. Obviously in person tends to expand us the quickest because we can ask them questions and, you know, live vicariously through them. But we even have a term called fragment expanders where you find them literally all over the place. They can be friends of friends, stories that you heard, you know, it's whatever is going to be that key point in your subconscious where you have that opening of, oh my gosh, she did that. Like I'm even kind of better at it. Usually when we have low self-worth, if we do feel more capable than the person who has achieved or is successful in, it actually helps us expand quicker. So those are really, really key. First two key points. And then the third, we always hear an old spiritual bypass manifestation that it's positivity. Uh, The example that I like to use a lot when I'm demystifying the positivity, you know, concept If you look at the narcissist in your life, they tend to be fantastic manifestors because they literally believe in what they're manifesting, that they can have it, and they have an inflated self of sense of self-worth. So it actually has very little to do with positivity and the world to do with subconscious self-worth. But I guess not all narcissists have high self-worth. No, no. And I mean, especially when you look at narcissism, it's a big spectrum of how that can present. But, you know, if we're just using it as an example, if you look at the people in your life who may lack a lot of positivity or qualities that one would think are very heart-centered and admirable, but they tend to be like really good manifestors, it usually has to do with a sense of self-worth or a sense of deservingness. Yeah, because I think the traditional, as it were, or the new age manifestation process of this like think positive attitude is one so rigid and also we think in sort of day-to-day linear thought in our conscious minds, but the subconscious is really the one in the driving seat for most of the time. And so I think that's why this work is so important and interesting because it's that thing, again, if, if people listening that might this all might sound quite foreign to them. They would relate to the concept of someone saying, I always go for unavailable men, this frustration or like, I'm not making enough money or all these kind of things. 
And it just feels so frustrating. They want something different and they're trying for something different, but they're not addressing that deep subconscious. So they're not able to reprogram and rewire. And that's why I think this stuff is so incredible and going to be so useful for people because it allows them to do that and to really unpin all that deep stuff that's going on below the surface. That's exactly it. And I mean, I even listening to you say that can remember from the ages of, well, teenage all the way to 25, 26 being like, you know, why, why isn't this changing? And on the floor crying, (laughs) I had a lot of those moments. And until I understood the power of, yeah, accessing the subconscious and, you know, overriding these old belief systems and literally, you know, creating a new sense of self, essentially, in a very, very mild way, that's when everything changed. So I'm quickly interrupting this episode to invite you if you're ready to start your manifestation journey or if anything you've heard in our manifestation episodes has piqued your interest to begin. We have a la carte workshops in everything from the basics bundle, which is what we recommend to everyone who starts. It's the formula that actually teaches you how to manifest, unblocked inner child and unblocked shadow. We also have a la carte workshops on love and money. But the real gem is the Pathway membership because it encompasses every single workshop we have. It's a year-long membership with full access to the few a la carte offerings we have and exclusive workshops not available anywhere else, such as the daily practice, which is what everybody in the Pathway uses, hopefully at least three times a week to daily in order to truly create the new neural pathways that one needs in order to manifest and houses the library of our deep imaginings, which is our unique hypnosis process that allows you to get into your subconscious and overwrite those old neural pathways, creating the new ones. You can use our special code EXPANDED, all caps, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D, to receive $20 off your first a la carte workshop purchase or $20 off your first month of the pathway. Again, that's all caps, EXPANDED, E-X-P-A-N-D-E-D. Okay, now back to the episode. And I think with the creating of the new sense of self, there is, I mean, I would say a sort of crumbling of the former, which I think probably brings up a lot of fear for people because they're having to dismantle something that essentially has allowed them to survive for a certain period of time. You know, it's been a necessary infrastructure. So the idea of like dismantling that is quite fear inducing. And also with the inner child work, it can be quite a painful process. Certainly so. And I think you touched on something so important. I call it the ego die off. And essentially what this work is really getting at that I learned very early on is what it's really guiding us to do is get back into our true, whole, worthy, authentic selves. And every one of us were born as that. And then through the act of the human experience... From day one, we start to experience pain, shame, and therefore we create an onion shell around us. And that's what we call the shadow. So it's the masks that we have to present as to survive or to be loved or to be liked. And this whole process of this work is to de-layer those layers of the onion or take off the masks and become truly our whole worthy, authentic selves. And through that process, There's a real discovery period. You know, it's really wild when you do the inner child work and the shadow work and you start to meet who you truly are. (laughs) It can be very scary to hear the process, but it's actually so extremely therapeutic to meet yourself and have a deep exhale and start to take all of that weight off and start to exist as yourself. Yeah, and I think that that's such a a relatable concept because we do especially in our sort of teenage years and 20s, I'd say try and fit in and, you know, be a certain person for our friendship or society or whatever that main influence is or our parents, our families. But then I say around your Saturn return, there becomes this thing where you just feel like, I have to actually be me, but we've sort of lost touch of who that is. It's so interesting with Saturn return and manifestation the like main goal of how they come together 
is that, you know, in our process of manifestation, there's a concept called tests, which nobody had ever pointed out before I really surveyed this pattern. And even hearing this, as I say it, many people will be like, oh my gosh, that always happens to me. That's always the reaction. When we're getting closer to manifesting the thing we truly want, we tend to be tested. So say we left the relationship that no longer served us or they left us and we're starting to call in the next experience or dating, we often receive tests, suitors that it's very obvious at first, right? It's like suitors that are really wrong or as our self-worth raises, it can be more subtle where it's our list, but they're emotionally unavailable or they don't want to commit or whatever within the testing process. So when it comes to Saturn return, the key, key energetics that matter the most in manifestation and when you're in your Saturn return is that you pass all the tests you know that you need to pass or the cliffs you know you need to jump off of. And so for me, for instance, it was that toxic job. I grew up in an environment that, you know, money was scarce when I was young. And so everything's about security and safety and leaving this job that had good benefits and was secure after waitressing and acting for so long. I remember my mom during that time was like, are you sure you want to leave Lacey or you, you have great benefits and you have retirement? And I was like, yes, I, like this is when I knew my process worked. I was like, yes, I'm leaving. And the universe will reward you. So beautifully. <laughs> so, so whenever I see people on their Saturn return and I can see they're just banging their head against the wall and they don't have that guidance. Oh, it's so painful to watch and knowing that it's just going to keep popping up in their life, right? Because that's the cycle of how Saturn return works. So just having that information for the people tuning in is really powerful, however it may present in your life. I completely connect and relate to that and I'm through your work I'm aware of it I have definitely had some situations recently where I'd say tests have come up and I wasn't necessarily gonna pass them but the universe sort of made me pass them if that makes sense so I had a relationship that ended at the end of last year and actually it was a hugely um it was a catalyst for great change for me and actually like put me right on the path that I needed to be on. It was incredibly painful, but it was a, a very classic Saturn return sort of breakup of like, it was overnight, everything fell apart and whatever happened, happened. But then since I was like, okay, I'm definitely, you know, I'm a big believer and you need to healthily process the emotions and everything you experienced and give, you know, space in between rather than jumping into something new straight away. And so I did, and I kind of have taken the year to do that. And then someone came along quite recently, I, I can't believe my shareholders are, but from my past that I was like, oh, okay, I, I feel, yeah, this feels right to like meet up with him and hang out with him. And anyway, it was like this very intense chemistry, this very like intense connection. And I guess I was aware on many levels that it was a pattern of behavior that had been my understanding of love, that love was this, you know, can't eat, sleep, breathe kind of obsessive intensity. That's like always has been my thing. So I'm kind of renowned through my friendships as someone that like will fall in love on the first date and we're sort of planning <laughs> our wedding. Like that's, that's yeah. been my thing. So this person came along and I knew on like a level that I was operating from like, a, I guess, a lower frequency within it. Nothing bad about him. He's an amazing person, but just the energy that I was coming from, I was like, this doesn't feel like where I need to be going. It then sort of, actually, I guess I did pass it because it then sort of started to like feel like it might fall apart and his behavior went really off, like trying to ghost style. And I was just like, no, 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 I'm not having any of this. And so I ended up sending him, because I was like, okay, I haven't really behaved how I want to behave in relationship in this experience, but what can I do now to kind of redeem that going forward? I was like, okay, all I can do is take complete accountability for my part and my behavior and gracefully like exit the situation. So I just sent him this voice note, basically being like, look, I felt like there was a connection. And I was like, but you know, I want to honor that connection by, you know, saying whatever I said. And I was like, you can not talk to me forever. If that's what you want to do, that's your experience. And you're entitled to that. I just wanted to speak my truth here. And anyway, ended up opening up a, a dialogue of a lot of integrity between us. And then I guess actually from that, then I met someone 
who was really amazing and like completely different from anybody I've ever dated in the best way. So I guess, yeah, that actually is an example of those tests. So number one, I love this because I do know your story from the last relationship, which, you know, dissolved really traumatically, but it also, well, anyways, I don't know if you've shared that, but anyway, going into this person who presented, you know, that you've just spoken about, I just want people to understand this terminology because it's a very clear example of that. So there's a theory called trauma bonding and attachment styles. Yes, yes. I'm so glad you brought this up. You're so hysterical about this. Is he started telling me about attachment theory oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> and saying that he had like anxious attachment to his ex-girlfriend and I kind of did wasn't that familiar with it and then right. after a bit I was like oh my god I'm anxiously attached yeah. Yeah. so yeah. I'm excited to hear what you have to say about that so when we have that moment most often than not, we have this course called Unblock Love. And it's literally the first day that we teach on trauma bonding because we're so programmed in society through things like Disney movies and Happily Ever After and rom-coms, Hollywood essentially, to tell us when we have that like kinetic, crazy attraction with somebody that it's a positive thing. I would give it a 2% chance that it is, you know, the love at first sight thing. It's very rare that I've ever heard that that ends up that way. But I will say 98%, it's usually a very big red flag of trauma bonding. And so what trauma bonding means is that your perfect trauma pieces, so say one of your your parents abandoned your other parent growing up, you seek ab- abandoners. And then basically the other person that you're having this like crazy experience with up front, their missing trauma piece is exactly, it fits perfectly with your missing trauma piece. And that's why it's this like insane attraction and energy and It's not to say that all trauma bonding can't work out, but if you have a great recognition of it and the other person you're meeting also recognizes it and has done a lot of work and as you're both like, let's put the brakes on, let's, you know, assess that, you know, there's a possibility, but you have to be dealing with an incredibly conscious person to do that. So that's also a 98% chance that that's even possible. (laughs) But that's something that I love to put on people's radar when they are calling in partnerships, because usually... it's, it's It's such a misrepresentation of what love in a relationship should really be about. But that is the mainstream narrative and through like every film we've ever watched. So rather than being like, oh, this is because it's that thing of those comments like you complete me or, you know, this thing that we're not complete without that other person all plays into that. And it is actually not fucking healthy. (laughs) It's so not healthy. And it'll save you a lot of time if you learn about this and do the work around it to actually find your person. And in fact, that was my specialty. There was one year that I connected, I think it was 67 people with their partners. And I will tell you this. Yeah, it was crazy because I learned this through dating first. So I became a pro (laughs) at dating. So anybody who's struggling, you should do Unblock Love for sure. But most often than not, I hear when you do find the person you've been manifesting and granted, like this is another thing you'll learn with this manifestation approach is it's not like you manifest your thing and it's happily ever after. I don't care what it is, job, whatever. We're, we're humans. We're constantly growing. Therefore, you'll reach this like manifestation. A great example, you know, for me, say calling in a child and once the child's here, it's not like the child's going to be this perfect child and I'm a perfect mom. You know what I mean? The work begins. But I will say, hands down, probably another 98% of the time when people actually manifest their person, that's correct and it's not a test. It usually feels like when your hands come together very effortlessly. There aren't games. You guys communicate. You're able to take it slow at your pace. Everybody is supportive of that. You don't feel like you're having to put on a front for sure intimacy in any way. And I don't mean having sex only. I mean, the moment you start having feelings for someone, your stuff is going to come up. You're going to pull all your stuff that you have from childhood and 
what you learned in relationships because that's intimacy C into me. It's very vulnerable. So I'm not saying that it won't have any of that, but it won't feel like games. It's not going to feel like that crazy, insane energy. So when you're going through the testing period, it's a really great energy to remember everything you just described in your second experience after your, you know, your ex totally. tests. <laughs> your third experience sounds like it has a good shot. Yeah, I know. It's actually really interesting because I'm basically a living example of this theory in practice because everything you say is like a hundred percent on and the tra- the trauma bonding thing like I think you know I empathize with those listening that are, are going through that because it's like the the greatest aphrodisiac oh, in the world it's right drug. it's the best it's drug, drug on the planet it's like yeah. it's human crack <laughs> but completely completely like if if someone's kind of in the demise of something like that like have faith because it's It's a necessary process. And I think that we need those experiences to have the contrast and definitely like a hundred percent with the person that I'm seeing now, how I describe it to my friends, I was like, he doesn't make me feel insecure. There's just none of that energy going on. It's just like you say, slow hands, like coming together. It's like a, it's like a slow flame. hundred percent. And I think that is something so important to talk about because a lot of people, when we start talking about tests, they'll, they'll really focus on it and obsess over it because we're both English and American culture is based on perfectionism. And so they'll be like, fuck, I failed the test. Oh my gosh. And so the first thing we always say, there's no such thing as failing a test because like your second experience, um, a lot of people who haven't fully learned those lessons yet of being a doormat, not saying that you were in this experience, but I think collectively, (laughs) many of us, us, you know, especially women, I'll say just again, because of the common narrative that exists out there and patriarchy and all that good stuff, we tend to go through phases of being a doormat, you know, or the older we get and wanting certain serious things. I'm definitely all about like, you cannot fail a test. And what happens if quote unquote, you fail a test, another one just comes because the whole concept of testing comes from Again, getting back to that theory that the universe, God, source, whomever you're talking to is just trying to get you back into your true, whole, authentic, worthy self that you came onto the planet as the testing period, you know, as a human, we tend to want more than we have. That's just human nature, animal nature. So therefore, the self-worth of what we desire tends to be higher than where ours is. And that's why we have to do a little bit of looking at the childhood and blocking, expanding to make sure that our brain really believes we can have this type of relationship. So I guess a key part of this is it's uncomfortable work. (laughs) It's not that easy breezy. And I, when I first started it, or sometimes I'll hear when people first start, they'll be like, especially when you do inner child and shadow work, they'll be like, whoa, <laughs> like they, they literally say it feels like 10 years of therapy in a month. It's so much that you're discovering and, and unblocking and uprooting, but it's, they're like, wow, this is so magical when they start to feel the harnessing of dancing with the universe and, and being like, wow, finally I have actual languaging and actionable steps and tools of how to make that connection with what I want. But it is, it isn't like making a vision board and thinking positive (laughs) or all the funny things I used to do. I always laugh where I remember reading all the books and like some of them would suggest in partnership to make the other night stand like it's like he exists already or put clothes <laughs> in the closet, you know, like that kind of silly, I call that spiritual bypass, you know, because you're bypassing the real deep work. I do think that there is something in that too, because <laughs> basically the person that I'm seeing now, I won't go into the detail, but he was not making energetic space for anyone And Mm. I could see that as I came in. So I do have some belief around that kind of stuff. Well, what I like about that too, because you guys attracted each other. And I do want to preface this, that I think the only reason why we attract anything into our lives, may we be consciously or unconsciously calling it in, is that we're all just mirrors to reflect back to each other where we need to get back to our true authentic selves. Totally. Okay. The last thing before you go, because thank you so much for for your time that I wanted to ask you about was the magic dark. My favorite. 
Yes. So it's a formula. (laughs) That's what it'll grow to be everybody's favorite because that's right when, you know, the thing is about to come through that you've really been calling in. So in it, you've unblocked, you've expanded, you have been passing tests. There's a phase that comes that took me a while to recognize as well, but it always came. It's called the magic dark. I, God, if I could go back and I would have termed all of this very differently, but it was the way that I could put a name to the energetic. And so what tends to happen is, especially if you had very low self-worth in your last experience, whatever it was, a terrible living situation, and you're calling in a better one, less pay, you're calling in much better pay in a better position, dating, you know, relationships, you've done those tests and you've been passing them and your self-worth was so low. So the tests are getting harder and harder to recognize as you pass them because they're getting more and more subtle. Then you hit this place usually that's called the magic dark. And what that looks like is, and this is very traditional again for people who had a very low self-worth experience. So I would have been a great example of that in that teaching job. You know, it's just like really abusive and terrible calling in, let's say if I were to have called in another you know, teaching job, a better one. I would have had a lot of tests, you know, and they would have looked like maybe another preschool that everything looked, you know, or it was very obvious at first that the faculty had something going on there. And then the second interview I do, it seems like the faculty's on point, but the parents might be really like, whatever, something that doesn't jive energetically. I can sense that. And then it gets more subtle. It's like the third might actually all be good but then you get some red flags from the director who's hiring you and say, I pass all of those. You know, I'm like, no, I recognize this. I'm passing it because I was in such a low self-worth position before the universe is going to throw me a magic dark. And what that is, it's this period where everything goes quiet. It's like crickets. There's no length that determines it, but The way I can describe it, it's kind of like when the water recedes out really far before it's going to, like the big wave's going to come, which is the manifestation. Or, you know, it can be like the darkest before the dawn. And in that time, what the universe is asking you, are you really sure you're not going to settle for that old low self-worth behavior again? Are you really sure? And when you're like fuck, I have $300 in savings and I keep saying no to all of these, you know, test experiences. Yeah, universe, I'm not fucking with you. I'm sure. Bam. That's when you connect with your thing. There is this one. So, you know, I'm in a position now where my fiance and I own a home in Topanga and we were doing a lot of landscaping. It's an acre. And because I come from a big lack environment, it's still really hard for me to like, not budget, you know, when we're trying to like, I look at these big numbers that are being proposed for like this huge landscaping job. And I'm like, oh my God, what? You know, even though we're splitting it and stuff like that, it's still, it'll show me where I have the work to do and unblocking still and expanding, even though we can pay for it. And I got to look at, whoa, I've been in really low self-worth mode. So when it came to doing our remodel on our house in Topanga, I knew like I have some serious up leveling to do and we have to take the people that are true professionals and pay like the full professional rate instead of like getting the friend or the thing or the whatever. And I had such a magic dark with it. I mean, it took us a year to get our permits. We saw so many contractors and architects and it was just like test after test and then crickets, the magic dark for a while. And then we finally settled on these ones. And it's been such an up-leveling experience the whole time. It's like, (laughs) it's just so, it's so much growth, you know, from what I come from and what I know. And, you know, another person who comes from wealth would maybe experience that in something like dating. So that's what a magic dart can look like. And it really tends to become your favorite, even though it's this lull period and you're like, what happened? I was on such a roll. It's so special because when you're in it, you're like, the thing is coming. It's really coming. And it's funny because we'll get people that confuse this. They'll like to hear this or they'll just start the work and they'll be like, oh, I'm in a magic dark. And we're like, no, you're in a rut. (laughs) 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 That's just means like nothing's happening and you think you're in a magic dark and it's not the case. A magic dark is after you've unblocked, expanded, you're passing tests. And there was a lot of momentum in tests. Whereas a rut, 
just nothing's happening, <laughs> which just means you're out of alignment with your authentic self and you just get back on your path. We have a whole workshop on that. Amazing. Well, Lacey, thank you so much. I love talking to you about all this and I think our listeners are going to take so much away from it. I love that. Thank you. And I can't wait to see you when I'm in the UK next. Thank you so much for tuning into the episode and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did, we did. And in case you're not totally ready to join the pathway yet, I wanted to share a few of our free offerings that I'll often suggest to people as a little bit of a blueprint to get them started on their manifestation journey. The first place I like to direct people completely for free is the motivation. You can see it linked below or on our homepage as our testimony library. And it's categorized by different subjects, whether you're calling in career, money, love, wellness, and much more. When you're reading about a member's experience of what they manifested, you're actually seeing to believe and showing your subconscious that that very thing is possible for you. The second place I like to direct people is to the free clarity exercise, which is also linked below. In it, you get to try our own unique hypnosis process, learn about the science and some journaling prompts. And the best part about this, you'll get a tiny taste of what it's like to go into your hypnotic state, bring your subconscious forward and create new neural pathways while receiving clarity. And the third thing, if you haven't listened to it on this podcast yet, please go back to the episode titled Manifestation 101, where you'll learn the basics of neural manifestation to truly understand this process. So go ahead and check out those free resources, the motivation, the free clarity exercise, and the episode Manifestation 101, all linked below. And in an effort to make sure to have representation in this process series, go ahead and submit any process testimonials you have, especially to our LGBTQ plus community, our BIPOC, as well as the WISE, which is anyone in the community who is 45 and over. All right, we'll be back next week.